Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce our second finalist for the research paper competition. Uh, Rajiv Maheswaran is a research assistant in computer science at the Information Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California. He has a laundry list of advanced degrees, including a PhD in electrical and computer engineering. Today, he's here to share his research on the impact of such factors as shot location and rebound height on offensive rebounding rates. Please welcome Rajiv. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, before we move on, I just want to give appropriate uh, credit. Um, so I did this, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Yuhan Chang and I, uh, our faculty at USC, and we did this with uh, a collection of our students. Uh, Sam Danis is here, uh, Aaron Hennehan, Gautam Kaushik, and Srikanth Nori all contributed that, uh, to this, and we appreci appreciate their efforts. Um, we're part of the Computational Behavior Group at the Information Sciences Institute of the University of Southern California. And our, our general research trend is we study data-driven models of human behavior. So studying this falls right within uh, our wheelhouse. And we use techniques like game theory, decision theory, machine theory, uh, mach machine learning. And all of these things are really just fancy ways of counting. When you just boil it down to it, it's just fancy ways of counting. And um, there's this relatively famous fellow who had this saying about counting. And it said, uh, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. And uh, there are a variety of philosophical interpretations of this. But in this context, I think for me it means don't be biased by the things that you're counting, and try and change what you're counting to move towards the things that really count in whatever you're studying. So what does that mean for us here? So what do we count in basketball? So we've had the box score, and we've made improvements. We've got play-by-play, -play, location for shots. But these are still a severely subsampled and essentially context-free observation of the ground truth. And people know it. So there's this other relatively famous fa fellow who said something like, someone created the box score and he should be shot. Now, I don't advocate shooting anyone and I don't actually know that he ever said that because I found it on the internet. Um, I also found on the internet that he said that the answer is better data. And uh, what Daryl wants, Daryl gets. And the people who give it is uh, stats. And you might have heard uh, a lot about this at the conference, but they have uh, a sport view technology that basically puts cameras around stadiums and tracks everything that goes on at 25 frames a second. And once they do that and you, and you get access to it, you get this, which is what I called 21st century gold. Um, so we spent a lot of time curating and building tools to look at this data, but that's what we get. What do we want, what do we want to do with this what we want to do is ultimately we want to translate it into some insight or evalu evaluation that is actionable. So there's someone who wants to use this data to make some decision. We need to make the gap from those numbers to something that someone can say, I can do something with that. Um, so let's look at, take a look at the data. What's in the data for those who are not familiar with it? Um, we have 10 players, the ball, the refs are in there. Um, we have uh, all kinds of events in the play-by-play -play data, but we also have things like passes and possessions and dribbles. So there's all kind of stuff that we could mark up this data with. It's a, it's a wealth of information. One of the interesting things we found when we had this data is it has the height of the ball at uh, 25 frames a second. And it's, it's conditioned on all kinds of events, and we can even add our own events. So one of the things we thought uh, the little red markers are there was when the ball descends below 10, 9, and 8 feet after a shot is missed. So these are the kind of things we can do. We can find the time slice when that happens and find everything that's going on on the court during that time. So we thought, this is really cool. Nobody has something like this. What can we do with that? And we thought, well, rebounding seems to be you know, a perfect uh, thing to investigate now that we have this height data. So another quote, uh, Pat Summit said, offense sells tickets, defense wins games, and rebounding wins championships. I don't know that she said that because I also found that on the internet. But I don't think I have to convince a lot of people that rebounding is very important. Um, now the issue with rebounding is that when we assign a rebound to someone, and someone has gotten a rebound, it's an end of a long series of uh, events and giving a plus one to a rebound is essentially context free. So we know that there are things that happen before the rebound. People position themselves all across the court to try and get the rebound and before that, someone took a field goal attempt 
And th that has consequences on what happened afterwards. But let's assume that we just look at a rebound in isolation and add space to it. Um, what, what do you think it would tell us about rebounding? So the first thing we're going to take a look at is offensive rebound percentage by rebound location. So let's do a thought experiment just right now in SA. If I tell you as the rebound location increases, what do you think will happen for the, to the offensive rebound percentage? And you can make a note in your head of what you think your hypothesis would be. So this is a map of where all, uh, there's about uh, 11,000 shots that we took a look at. This is where all the rebounds were obtained. So a large number are very close to the, ba uh, to the basket, but many of them go far away from the basket. So what we can do is we can mark who got the rebound at these various points, and we can see how offensive rebound percentage changed as a function of this. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna show an equivalent radial plot of this, and this is what we see. So very near the basket, there's a high percent chance that if, it was if, we, if the rebound occurred very near the basket, it was a highly likely that it was an offensive rebound, mostly because of tip-ins. But once you get a few feet away, then pretty much the defense takes over, and as you go further away, offense gets better and better. And this probably follows what one might consider conventional wisdom. You know, the defense owns the, you know, close to the basket, offense goes further away from the basket. But this is not particularly actionable, because you're not going to tell somebody, okay, I want you to miss, but when, if you're, I want you to make the shot, but if you miss the shot, I want you to miss long so we have a better chance of getting the rebound. That's not, I would think, a worthwhile strategy. Um, I mean, some people, there, there is the notion of the long shot and long rebound, and some people might justify long shots by saying, well, they give us a better chance of getting the ball back. But we don't know that. So why don't we look at that? What, because a shot is something we have more control over. Coaches design offenses to take shots, particular types of shots, at particular type uh, of places, and mostly, I would assume they would want a high likelihood of scoring points. But what effect then does it have on rebounding? So what we're going to look at is offensive rebound percentage by shot location. So again, let's play another thought experiment. As the shot location gets further and further away from the basket, what do you think happens to offensive rebound percentage? OK? So here is a plot of where all the shots were taken. So a lot in the middle, a lot near the three-point line, but a shot's pretty much all around the court. And we can count who got the rebound when that shot was taken and map the effect of shot on offensive rebound percentage. It looks at something like this. Let's go straight to the numbers. That's what it looks like. So is that what you imagined it looked like? So it's sort of the exact opposite in a way of what rebound location is, which is what we observe, tells us about shot location. So what this means, if you look, if you basically look up to about 21 feet, th there's a very high chance that if you shoot it near the basket, you have a much higher chance of getting the ball back, which may be intuitive because the shooter is near the basket. And as you keep going, as you, the shot you take goes further and further away, the likelihood you get the ball back goes further and further down. And if you map it, there's, it's a relatively linear uh, uh, slope down, and it's, it's highly predictive. And basically, you're roughly losing 1% of offensive rebound percentage for every foot you go away from the basket. But then something happens at 21 feet, or roughly 21, 22 feet. It starts reversing itself. It starts going up again. So it almost, it, it, it starts going up at roughly 1% per foot. That's not such a good predictor, but that might be because it's near the three-point line and there's a nonlinear effect because the three-point line is not uniform, but it clearly reverses itself. So there's this phenomenon where you have this sort of weighted V-shape, and in a way it mirrors what you might think about effective field goal, goal percentage. It's sort of, you should really take stuff, you know, really close to the basket, and mid-range shots are bad, but what this really does is it, it amplifies the effect of EFG. If you're doing something, if you think something is good for EFG reasons, offensive re the, its effect on offensive rebound percentage makes it even worse. So a person who can get close to the basket is even more valuable. A person who takes mid-range shots is even more worse because not only is it a bad EFG, the, the resulting offensive rebound percentage magnifies that. The other thing to note is, you know, when you look at EFG and offensive uh, rebound percentage, 
You know, if you look, believe, look at the four factors model, those are independent factors that affect how, uh, how your offensive efficiency, you know, how good an offensive team you are. But really, when we look at this, there is this currently hidden variable, which is where you take your shot, which affects both of them. So when you're designing an offense, what you're really saying is what, by choosing where you shoot, not only are you affecting how well you shoot your, the expected points, but you're also affecting your offensive rebound percentage. So all the effects are magnified. So we looked at outside the stat sports we did just to make sure we weren't, you know, we were saying we looked at all the teams and how their offensive rebound percentages uh, changed over shot distance. And basically what we find is the effect is still there. The, the rebound percentage might shift up and down, but you basically get the same roughly 1% per foot loss up to about 21, 22 feet, and then all of a sudden stuff goes back up again. So if you look at it, I mean, in both cases, uh, you know, a, three point a rough three-point shot has the same offensive rebound percentage as basically a 10, 11, 12 foot shot. Now the EFG is a little higher, so really the value of a, of a, a three point shot is much closer to taking a shot near six or seven feet, and then there's this valley in the middle. So there you have your lesson. Take, which you already knew, which is you know, even more important, take stuff, go close to the basket and take, take three pointers. Maybe that's, you know, I already knew I should do that, I just need to do it even more. But what if you can't? What if you don't have the talent that's able to get to the, get to the hole? What, what if you don't have good three-point shooters? Is there nothing you can do? Um, well, there's the middle process, which is you can do stuff after the shot has been launched and between the points the rebound has gotten, which is you can reposition yourself and you can block out what should you do in that place. So we're going to look at positioning for rebounds. So this is a little, this is a, one of the interesting things we can do with this data. Um, one of the things we can look at is where the ball should, should have been rebounded as opposed to where it was rebounded. So how are we going to find a place where it should have been rebounded? So we took a look at the standing reach of various players. So it turns out 94% of the drafted players in the last 10 years have a standing reach of over eight feet. And almost the ones who don't are very, very close. So if the ball gets to eight feet and you're properly positioned, it seems to be a reasonable assumption that you should be able to get the ball. Now the question is, where is the ball going to be? So imagine for yourself that you take all the shots that were taken and it bounces off the rim. Where is it going to come down at eight feet? What is that spread going to look like? So maybe you can do a thought experiment in your head and sort of guess what you think that might look like. So that's the scatter plot of the location of the ball sliced it when it went through eight feet. Um, so basically it says that the bulk of that is inside seven feet and almost all of it is inside 14 feet. So, and that, what, that, what you notice is that's far, in, far inside where most players are positioned when the ball is reboundable. So it's, the rebounds basically happen much closer to the basket either than one might imagine or where position, players are positioned to get them. I haven't talked much about angle. I'm just going to make a comment is that what we found is there are small effects due to angle, but we have not found anything particularly compelling, so we're, I haven't, you know, we're not going to talk about them much, but we can talk about them more offline. So we're just going to, for now, we're just going to talk about distance. And so let's look at sort of, this chart basically shows the X is how far away the shot was taken, and the Y basically is, this, is the scatter of where the ball crossed the eight-foot threshold. So that's basically sort of a heat map of the probability distribution. So what, do you, what can you tell from that? So most of the action is under within six feet of the basket. The bulk, you know, the bulk of the mass of that, re regardless of where the shot was taken, whether it was close or far away. If it's close, there's hardly anything outside six feet. If it's farther away, if you go out to 15 feet, you'll pretty much capture everything. And you can actually do this more quantitatively in the sense that, you know, if you want to be in position to get 97.5% 90, of the rebounds, be within 14 feet of the basket. If you want to get 90, if you're willing to get 90% of the rebounds, be within 10 feet of the basket. And so the reason you want to get there is you want to be the person who is closest to the ball when it crosses eight feet. Now, why do you want that? So the reason, let's, we looked at the, we, we can look at all the, where, since we know all the players' positions, we can figure out all the various configurations that might happen when the ball crosses eight feet. So th this case basically says if z zero means that the closest player is a defender, one means the closest player is, is an offensive player. Zero, zero means close two players are defense, 
zero one means defense than offense. So hopefully that makes sense. So another mini thought experiment to say is how much does either of this, each of this stuff matter? How much does it matter that you keep the offense from being the closest player, from being the second closest player, and so on and so forth? So here are the numbers as the ball descends between below 10, 9, and 8 feet. And there are a lot of numbers there, but what really jumps out is the fact that the biggest thing is keeping the offense from being the closest person to the ball. That's a, a huge effect. So at 10 feet, it's a 30% 30 30 marginal gain. And as the ball descends, it gets to over 40% marginal gain. Everything else is sort of lost in the noise. So basically, you've got to keep the offensive player. If you're an offensive player, you just want to be cl the, the closest person to the ball. If you're a defender, you just want to keep an offensive player for being closest to the ball. And because that's the prime separator of whether it's going to be rebounded by the offense or not. The other factors matter, but they're sort of lost in the noise of, of the first effect. And what, you know, uh, if you want to be closest to the ball, you have to go where the ball is going to end up, and that is much closer to the, the, the basket than most people are hanging out. So if you're a team that is forced to take long two-pointers, what can you do to help yourself? After you launch your shot, go closer to the basket. And we'll see, we'll see that in some charts later. Oh, right now. So one of the things we can do with this realization is we can try and explain this nonlinearity and this op offensive rebound percentage. Like, why does it jump back up, right? Because there are lots of possible hypotheses. So what we did is, what we can do is we can find the spatial distributions of the players. So what this basically says is the top five are the, off the five closest offensive players, the bottom five is the five closest defensive players. And that's, that's the distribution of where they're sitting away from the basket um, when various in various shot zones. So we have zero to seven foot shots, seven to 14 foot shots. Um, so we can, we can make these distributions. You know, where are they from seven to 14 feet? Where are they from 14 to 21? Where are they when the shots are taken uh, from 21 to 26? You'll see that the, a lot of them are outside 14 feet in most of the cases. Now what we can do to understand why offensive rebound percentage changes is we can find the changes in these spatial distributions. Basically like, wh where are people lying in this set of shots versus this better set of shots? So bear with me, this is, a little, uh, this is a little subtle and I can talk to you in more detail, but what the red and the green shows is basically green is where they're moving towards and red is where they're leaving. One thing to notice is that the changes are relatively small. There are small shifts, but they, create big difference in rebound percentage. So the, the reason where a rebound percentage goes down in, uh, as, the, as the shots go away is if you look at the first three closest offensive players, they are shifting away from the zone where the ball is going to drop. The, the defensive team is also shifting away, but not quite as much as the offensive team is shifting away. But if when we go from the long two-pointer to the long three-pointer, I mean to the three-pointer, if we look at not the first offensive player, but the second and the third most uh, closest offensive player, for some reason, they are shifting closer to the basket. Now, I don't know why, why that is happening, but that is what is happening. And so therefore, they're getting more of the space where the ball comes, and that's where, why they're getting more rebounds. Now, I don't know why systematically that's happening, if that's a function of the offense, if they're crashing the boards more, uh, if it's just a matter of the plays that are being run that generate three-pointers, but. At this level of analysis, that's what we know what's happening. That's what the data says is happening. So, so this is really why we, wa we want to really say, like, to really understand something, we like to be able to predict it. Our, the, our ability to predict something tells us how well we know something. So in the paper, we talked about lots of various uh, machine learning techniques. We threw a bag of machine learning techniques to try to understand the space of predictability. But we really wanted to get fully leverage the spatial aspect of this data. So what we did for every single shot that was missed, we looked what the ball bounced out, and we looked at all the players, and we did this. So what that is, it's known as um, a Voronoi tessellation or a Dirichlet tessellation. And that's a fancy way of saying, I'm going to give credit to the player who's closest to the space. So if you're closest to that space, you get that space. So the, the blue players are on defense, they, get, they control all that space that's closest to them, the red players, are the offense they control both that space that's closest to them. And then we overlay the, pro the spatial probability distribution of where the ball's going to get, end up. And that basically gives us a prediction of how likely the offense versus the defense is going to get the ball. 
So we tested this against the, the phenomenon we were seeing. So this is the phenomenon we're seeing in terms of offensive rebound percentage as a function of distance. What does the Voronoi tessellation prediction tell us about what's going to happen? It's not bad. It tells us it's relatively close to what the actual phenomenon is. Now, the, now we obviously ignored lots of factors here. We didn't even look at the player's height, any of their capabilities. They were just dots. And we want to move forward to you know, get better and better uh, simulations of spatial sort of partitioning because one of the interesting things you can do if you have a good method is then you could run multi-agent simulations. You can investigate various strategies. So a coach can say, what if I blitz two players and send three back? What if I blitz four? What are the effects? If we can get an appropriate allocation you know, from, from tessellation to prediction, you can test all kinds of, all kinds of theories in the space um, in, in, the spa in the spatial plane. So to run over the results that we've gotten talked about so far, um, offensive rebound percentage, like effective field goal percentage, depends on shot distance. So their shot, shot location really affects two things, which are really important. You lose about 1% per foot, up to about 21 feet, and then things change near the three-point three line. Um, most shots are reboundable within 11 feet of the basket. So basically, if you want to get a rebound, and, you, and now that I've seen these stats, I watch the game completely differently. I watch, I see myself watching where the ball is going, and I, I see like when it bounces, like if that guy had just moved in five feet, he would have gotten that, or that player would have gotten instead of that player. And I mean, obviously, I'm not an athlete. Running around takes a lot of energy. But once you see this and you start watching the games, you see stuff dropping. And you can see if they had just moved here, if he had taken, taken over that piece of space, they would have gotten a rebound. And I find myself watching the games completely differently now that I've been staring at this data. Um, and finally, it, it surprised me that how much the value of being the closest player is. I mean, almost all the value is in being the closest player. Uh, there's a large amount of marginal value in there. And the, cool, the, the really important thing is spatial temporal data, it'll help you find explanations for stuff, it'll help you predict stuff, and it'll help you simulate stuff. And there's, you know, as all of us know, there's a the wide range of things we can do. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about ongoing and future work, and I'm going to draw an analogy to sort of what's going on with data here to sort of scientific endeavors in the past. So when people are trying to study phenomenon in the past, I'm going to look at sort of the skies. People would look at the skies, and then they would see stuff, and then they would make hypotheses. And these hypotheses may or may not be so good about the truth. And then you would look a little deeper. And then you might discover a little bit of the truth. And then you bring out the big, big, the big toys. And then basically the universe sort of opens itself up. So what can you do? I mean, we basically did this initial survey to see what can we do with this data? Like, how do we play with it? But now we are really fully leveraging the fact that you just don't have shots. You have locations of everything. You have locations of movements. And we're able, at least at this point initially, to form really, really unique and interesting fingerprints of all kinds of players' behaviors. We can map how they behave under all kinds of circumstances and uh, basically make interactive ways of slicing up complete spatiotemporal behavior in terms of what people are doing. And so there's lots of exciting stuff that's sort of coming that lets us do all kinds of interesting work. So thank you for your time. Again, if you have questions, I believe, uh, please use the mic. Hey, so first of all, I just want to say that this data set is actually really, really awesome. I definitely appreciate you guys bringing this to the conference. Um, and I think one thing that was really cool and sort of a constant theme throughout your presentation was this idea that guys should try and get closer to the basket, because obviously that's where the rebounds go. And to some extent, you know, maybe the guys are lazy or maybe they're defenders in their way, but there's also sort of a trade-off between crashing the offensive glass and getting back on defense and stopping transition opportunities. And so I think a really cool question is whether or not teams on offense are balancing this trade-off in the right way. And so something you could definitely look at is what are the positions of offensive players on the court, and then if they're too close to the basket, do they give up more transition buckets on the way back when they miss a shot? Does that, does that make sense? We've, we've already yeah, we t totally thought about this. This is the question we, whenever we say, OK, everybody should go close to the basket. And it's like, well, there are other reasons. And there are. Mm -hmm. But with this data, you can actually analyze it. Because right now, basically, offense at best sends one person into sort of the, the, main, yeah. uh, you know, the main density area. So 
If you could find out that if you could send three people back on defense and you could basically shut off most, most fast break opportunities, if that was, then you, you would have the freedom to send two people into, into, the, into the, the, the main uh, eight foot area. Now, we don't know, maybe, that's actually, maybe you actually need to go back and send four people, but all this stuff is answerable with this data. I don't know that I, don't know that I have the answers now, but it's certainly answerable. Yeah, no, absolutely, because I think definitely some of the best teams, like I think the Spurs are famous for just having the strategy of one guy crashes, you know, Dewan Blair crashes, Tim Duncan can right. back and protect the paint. And I, I mean, it definitely results in a lot fewer trades. Right, and the nice thing if you slice the Z-plane is you can actually tell you, like, how can you, how do you crash intelligently, right? Because if you, if you crash and you go to 15 feet, then you're saying, I'm standing outside the plate. Oh, if you're going to crash and you're only going to go to 15 feet, then you might as well run back. I mean, so it really totally tells you, like, there are, pl there are ways to crash the boards, and there are ways not to crash the boards. And with, with this data, you could really find out what the effective ways are and what the effective ways aren't. And uh, I also want to echo your point that this data is incredibly awesome. And I have no <laughs> doubt that in two, three years, everyone will have it because, you know. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Yep. Um, you mentioned... <clears throat> You mentioned a little bit about it, but I want to ask you specifically, are you able to tell, I mean, when you're playing one-on-one playing -on -one with a friend and they miss it, I mean, you say it was a, you would say that's a good miss. It's, you're right, some, some misses are better for offensive rebounds than others. Are you able to tell what's, what types of shots lead to good misses, favorable misses? So, I mean, I'm extrapolating from exactly what I said here. I mean, a good miss is something that improves your chances, your team's chance to to get uh, you know to get the ball back now. That depends on a lot of factors. Like, are you taking? You I shouldn't take a bad shot just because I know somebody's, you know, crashing the boards. There's a lot of factors. Like, if your team is not going to crash the board, then why opt add, add that as part of your Let optimization fu function? I think that there are ways to, to to use your offense and to use your tendencies to to realize the true value of a particular shot. Like, if you have a particular, if somebody's saying, what's the value of a 15 point shot in the corner? Um, if you look at EFG, you can, you can know your player pretty well, but you, have to, you basically have to daisy chain all the factors, the factor that what's the likelihood that it's going to lead to an offensive rebound, what's the likelihood that if that's a defensive rebound that it'll lead to a fast break, and this data will basically let you put together the right sort of probabilistic network that lets you answer those questions. Um, I, I mean, I wouldn't want to sort of completely hypothesize without data, but what I would say is the answers are in there if we keep digging. So. Okay, let me rephrase my question real okay. quick. If two players, one player, they both shoot 50% from the field, sure. but one player, half of his misses lead to offensive rebounds because he misses in certain areas. It comes off the rim in a certain way. I see. Are you able to differentiate between that? Because so, then the way a player misses becomes valuable. Yes, yeah, so uh, we did not look on a per player basis. So if you're saying there are certain players who miss longer or miss shorter, that might actually be better. I didn't, we have not, we didn't actually slice the data on a per player basis. We could look at that in your side. You're right. If there was some player who ha happens to miss in a particular way that makes it more advantage to the offense, that would certainly be a more valuable miss, right. a more valuable misser. I don't have any data that would, you know, that show that the the the, the variations in the missing patterns. Okay. Yes. Um, you said in your research that uh, the longer the rebound it is, the more likely the offense is to recover. Is that more a factor of longer rebounds or the effect of tip outs to the offensive player? So, and again, I'm hypothesizing here, because what turns out is that the spatial configurations of people when the ball is coming down is people are far more spread out. And this is also in the paper, a lot of balls get, get rebounded very low or hit the ground. So basically, they hit the ground and basically at that point, it becomes noisy. So it gets further away to where the players are because the area of density where the ball is actually in the, what I call the reboundable edge, is not that densely populated at that current time. If you saw those spatial graphs of all the players, you'd see that very, there's very little weight in the actual, uh, in the, in the inside 14 and inside seven foot area. So the reason they all split out is people are hanging out there, not that many people are coming in and the ball is bouncing out or being tipped out. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm, uh, so I'm curious, were you able to, or did you look at the type of defense that was being played, so zone versus man-to-man? -man? Because I would imagine, so zone defense might result in more three-point shots, which would inherently lead to kind of a better offensive rebounding percentage because uh, the, the man isn't on the offensive player to block him out, uh, et cetera. So we didn't look specifically at that, but th that would be, I mean, we didn't partition, but that, 
the notion of playing bad defense would be captured in the Vor in sort of the Voronoi tessellation. Because what 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 the Voronoi tessellation would say is that if I go further out to to uh, protect against the ball, I'm basically giving up that space. I'm potentially giving up that space uh, between myself and the basket. Or so if you're sort of front guarding somebody in the post, you know, and they come in and then they take a shot and they miss it, you've basically given the interior points of the probability distribution to other players. Now. At this point, we, we are not classifying the type of defense being played. Um, so we are just looking at, one of the things you can do is you could, if somebody wanted to do this, and they basically went out and said, here's the games where I played, played uh, zone defense, and here's the games where I didn't, you could see sort of the, the tessellation saying, are those tessellations putting me in worse rebounding position than the ones in where I'm actually playing man-to-man? Uh, uh, -man? And in that way, you could actually answer that question. So, but we did not, we, I mean, if somebody wanted to do that, that's an answerable question. Thanks. Yep.